All right, hey everyone, we're live. So today I'm going to be talking about the solutions to code forces around 877. Um, it was a pretty fun contest. Let's see, so um, I was the uh, first person to finish the set, assuming that I don't FST on anything, but I took a little bit long on some of the early problems and then had a few penalty submissions on F, and so um, I ended up in, um, in third within striking distance of the other two, so I'm pretty happy with how that went overall. Um, yes, yeah, so we're just going to go through the problems from um, A through to F in order, and I'll uh, go or um, I'll take questions in the chat as we go. So let's start with A. So we have two integers written on a blackboard, and n minus two times we're going or we I guess the problem setter picked two integers on the board and wrote the absolute value of their difference on the board. Uh, and we're given the final list of n integers and have to pick one of the initial two numbers. If it's possible, if like there are, um, oh, huh, I guess they changed the statement. Originally it said that if there are multiple possible pairs that could have generated the input, you have to select the number that's present in all of them. Um, I'm not sure that actually changes the result, but in any case. So, there are, so the first thing we should notice here is that the absolute value of the difference of two numbers is always going to be negative, or sorry, it's always going to be positive. So no, ne so no negative number can be added to the board as a result of this process. So if a negative number is in the array, it must have been there from the beginning. So we can just uh, output it as our answer. So now let's say that all the numbers are non-negative. Then if we think about the absolute difference of two numbers, it has to be less than or equal to the larger of the two numbers. Um, the equal two cases if one of the numbers is zero, like the apps in this five three zero 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 three case, for example, the three the absolute difference of three and zero is three. And so in this case, the largest number must have been on the board from the beginning because so the, the so the difference of any two numbers is less than the larger number, meaning that like if we whatever the absolute value of the largest number at the beginning is. We can't get any number with a larger absolute value than that because we can never, or because taking the absolute difference of two numbers will never get us something with a bigger absolute value. So that tells us that the largest number must be uh, must have been in the array at the beginning, so we can output it as our answer. Okay, um, so I'll show you what my code looks like. Um, it's pretty quick, I just read it in the input and I sort the array, and then if the smallest number is negative, so if there's any negative number, I output it, and otherwise I output the largest number. Pretty straightforward. Always async asks, what is your words per minute? Um, I uh, type around 150-ish when I'm taking a, like, a typing test, and 120-ish in like daily life. Okay, so moving on to B, minimize permutation summaries, which a few people have been discussing in the chat already. So we're given a permutation, and we're going to swap two elements exactly once. And it turns out that since I and J are allowed to be the same, we do have the option of not actually swapping anything. Um, our goal is to minimize the number of subarrays of this permutation that are themselves permutations. So we have, and we have to output the swap that will minimize the number of permutations that appear as subarrays. Um, yeah, it's a fun fact, by the way, well, I need, yeah, I need to, I need to, uh, to think about whether this is easier than I think it is, but I think actually writing the judge for this problem, like, in other words, figuring out if the solution is correct is actually harder than solving the problem, um, which might be a fun exercise for some of you to think about. But anyway, in terms of figuring out the solution, there, a good first observation is that we always have at least two subarray permutations. Um, we're always going to have just one, and we're always going to have the uh, entire array is going to be a permutation of 1 through n. So we're always going to have at least two permutations. And a lot of the time, when you have this per a problem that's like early in a div2 round, and you're trying to like minimize something, and there are always, and there are like these obvious cases that you're always going to have, a lot of the time with problems like this, they're less open-ended than it seems, and it turns out you can always construct a solution that has just these two obvious permutations. So we might get 
So you might say, okay, maybe it's always possible to just have these two subarray or permutations as subarrays, and we'll try and construct an answer under that constraint. And it turns out that that guess is correct. So we're going to try and make sure that we don't have any permutations other than 1 and 1 to n. And at this point, there are a few other helpful things you might notice. So any permutation other than 1 will contain 2. So any subarray that's a permutation that we are, that we want to avoid is going to contain 1 and 2. But moreover, any permutation other than the, set, the permutation 1 to n will not contain n. So that means that any of the subarrays we want to avoid can't contain n. So what we might want to do is we want to ma might make sure that there are no subarrays that contain 1 and 2 but not n. And so the way we can do this is to make sure that n is between 1 and 2 in the array. And if we do that or and if we do this then um we are um yeah sorry if we do this then um any subarray that contains 1 and 2 which is required for a permutation of length greater than 2 will also contain n and so the only option is to have the whole subarray of length n. So to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to find 1, 2, and n in the array. And if n is already the middle of these three numbers, we'll just do nothing. So And so you could like swap the 1 and the 2, or you could just output like 1, 1, and then so not do any swaps. Otherwise, we'll just swap n with whichever number is in the middle. And that way, n will be between 1 and 2, and we'll be good to go. Um... Yeah, so that's the um, or so that's how this goes. And in general, a lot of these problems it seem like there are a lot of possible things you could do. It turns out that like some simpler strategy is cor um is correct. And in particular, um, like I mentioned, you might think to or you might do a bit of wishful thinking and think like, okay, we always are going to have these two permutations. What if we're there, the only ones? Um, yeah, so there are, so this is the general idea. Um, okay, let's see. Any questions? Yeah, and so some people are, by the way, are talking about solutions that just like deal with one and two, two like for example, making sure that they aren't adjacent or making sure they're really far apart. Um, and it turns out, or but it turns out that you can run into some issues this way. And let me see if I can. And so, I'll try and come up with an example. Like if we have like four, one, two, three, for example, then one thing. Then if we try, if we're just trying to put two as far away from one as possible, then you know, actually here, let me give a better example. So five, one, two, three, four. Yeah. So if this is our example, if we're just trying to maximize the distance between one and two we might get something like 5, 1, 3, 4, 2. But then this has the permutation of 1, 2, 3, 4 here. So it turns out that it is really important to consider n as well. Uh, and someone is, has a question about the um, fifth test case, 5. Let's see, so 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 1, 4, 5, 9. And then um, the answer that they give here is 9, 5. So we're going to get 8, 7, 6, 3, 9, 1, 4, 5, 2. Yeah, so this is not exactly the same answer that... Um, so it's not the same answer that like we would get with our strategy, but it is still correct. It turns out that the only permutations of the, that appear as subarrays here are just 1 and then 1 through 9. Because we can't get 1, 2, because 1 and 2 have these, like, 4 and 5 in between them. We can't get 1, 2, 3, because we can't get... And then we, we can't get 3 without getting the 9 as well. And if we, as soon as we've got the 9, the only possible perm, or permutation is the entire array. So this answer is correct. It just is a different valid answer from what our strategy would give us. Um, okay. And someone's asking for the contest to be open to resubmit. So I'm not on the contest staff, so I can't do anything about that. But the contest will be open after system testing finishes. Um, let's see. So yeah. So this is so this is so the, so just to clarify, what I'm discussing for the test case five is not an error in this solution or in the sam or sample output. So the sample output and then the solution I gave would give you different answers. Like my solution on this output 
would swap the 1 and the 9 to give an array like this. But both of these answers are correct. Um, and then so I asked, why are the sample inputs so non-intuitive? Um, a lot of the time, the contest authors don't want to won't, don't want you to be able to just guess what the solution is from looking at the sample outputs. So they provide they do, and uh, the, uh, this guy did, did this in C as well, where the solution or he ended up intentionally giving like pretty contrived answers to the sample out input so that you wouldn't be able to just reverse engineer the solution. Um, and Ankhan asks um, why is, or why his solution is failing. So I don't have time to go over every like possible incorrect solution and explain why it doesn't work. But maybe someone in the chat um, can help you out. So looking at C, um, for this problem we have an n by m grid, and we want to fill it with the numbers from one to n times m, so that no two, um, or so that for every two adjacent cells in the grid the absolute difference in their values is composite, or I guess not composite, is not prime. So one is also a valid option. Um, and we can construct any possible solution. Okay, so to go over, um, or so there are a couple of things we might try, but big picture, this is just a problem where you have to try a bunch of things and see what works. So the most obvious first thing that we might try for say the four by four case, is like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And now the difference between any two horizontally adjacent numbers is 1, and any two vertically adjacent numbers are 4 apart, and since 4 is composite, then this is fine. The problem is that um, if we try to generalize this to, for example, the 5 by 7 case, we run into trouble because we would do like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. But now the difference between vertically adjacent elements is 5, which is prime. So we know how to solve the problem when n or m is composite, but when n or m is prime, it's a little bit more, or when n and m are both prime, it's a little bit difficult. So the idea here is that we're going to stagger the rows so that each two adjacent rows are different by a multiple of n, but not by n itself. And so that way, a multiple of n we know is not going to be prime. And so as an example here, if n is 5, or so here, if n is 5, if we can make sure that two of the adjacent rows are different by 10, then that's composite and so we're going to be okay. And so one general strategy to do this is we're going to alternate rows so that each of the rows in the first half of the grid are separated by, I guess I should say, 2 times m. Um, and uh, as are each of the rows in the second half. And to illustrate what I mean, I'm, I'll show you for the 5 by 7 case what this looks like. So we're going to start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And instead of going through for 6 through 10, we're going to skip straight to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then similarly, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, we're going to skip 16 through 20. And then now we're going to skip 26 through 30, and we're going to do 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. And now we're going to go back to the beginning, and now we're going to and we're going to fill in those rows that we're missing. So we're going to do 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and we're going to skip 11 through 15, and then we're going to do 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, skip 21 through 25, and then 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And so now each of these first four rows is different by 10. So that's fine. Either they're each different by 2n, and 2n is going to, or sorry, 2m, I, I guess I should, uh, hold on. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess here I've done, I've technically done n equals 7, n equals 5. So these are each different by 2m, um, as our each of these is different by 2m. And then, but then, um, and then the, the middle section here, these are different by 31 minus 6 is 25, so 5m, so that's also fine. So this, is a, so this is a general strategy that will work for any n and m. And I'll show my, I guess I didn't show my code for b real quick, so I'll, I'll do that first. It's pretty simple. I create this array vals that contains the position of I u, 0, and next thing, so 0, 1, and n minus 1. I sort them, and then if the uh, largest value in the array is in the middle, then I just 
do an empty swap. And otherwise, if the largest value is first, I swap the first element, or I swap, I guess I basically just swap the um, position of the largest element to the middle. Um, oh yeah, someone says the uh, difference between the last two rows is five. Yeah, sorry, this uh, I uh, I already used the 21 row. This should be 27 or 26 through 30. Yeah, thanks for the correction. Um, yeah, a couple of people commented on this. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. This should be good to go. Um, all right. So I'll show my code real quick. The first thing I do is I figure out the order of the columns. So I end up starting from two, from two to N. This is, the code is a little bit um, clunky since I was kind of hasty while I was writing it. But essentially, I start with the even columns and then add in, or sorry, the even rows and then add in the odd rows. And then afterwards, I output the row number times M plus um, the position within the row. And so just I'll show you what this outputs on the sample input just for visualizations. Um, and actually here, maybe I'll show you how it works on the 7.5 case that I showed you. Here, it does the second half first um, of what I did, but otherwise it's exactly the same output. Let's see. Um, yeah, someone asks, how do you notice these? Uh, I would say 1700 to 1800, but couldn't find anything for B and C. I think for, for this particular problem, I think it's really just a matter of trying a lot of things. And in particular, so with this one and also with B, um, a lot of what makes the problem hard is that it feels there are a lot of like possible things you could try. And so you have to, and so you have to figure out some strategies for, um, I guess essentially eliminating possibilities and figuring out like a smaller set of things that might actually be useful to try. And for B, I think the key intuition is thinking, okay, we're always going to have these two permutations. What if like doing some wishful thinking these two permutations, 1 and 1 through n, are the only ones we have. And for C, I think the uh, way to think about it is like, okay, for like the 4-4 case, we have this nice solution. And in particular, when we're just going, counting by ones within each row, then that makes things a lot simpler because then we just need to make sure that the column differences are composite. And, um, and so when we are, and so when that's, and so when that's all we have to, or th that like essentially gives us one less thing to think about. And so even though this particular way of arranging the columns, um, or sorry, arranging the rows doesn't work, we might think about if there's another way to arrange the rows so that we can still do this one apart thing. Because um, if we had to like think about both like weird differences within the rows and weird differences within the columns, then it would just be really complicated and hard to think about. So um, a lot of time like trying to make simplifying assumptions is a good idea. So let's see, someone is worried about n equals 4 and m equals 5. So here, I'll actually just show you what my code outputs for that. Um, yeah, so I guess the, so the key element here I get, and this is, this is where it matters essentially that I do the even rows first. If I did odd rows first, um, like I did in this example, then I think I see the issue you're describing. It would be like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then we would go back to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then the difference would just be 5. But because, we, but because we're starting with the larger numbers, in the, uh, the only case where this can like run into issues is when n equals 4. And when this happens, we, this way we're going down by 3 times m rather than by 1 times m. Um, so that's basically the... Um, yeah, so that's basically the issue that you can or that you might run into. And that's why we that's why I start with the even case. Jerry says I was trying something using diagonals for C. How do I know if I'm overcomplicating the solution? I mean, usually basically you should try I mean, the ideal strategy is to try ideas in increasing order of complexity. And so here I think basically the reason the diagonals don't feel super motivated to me is because mostly we're interested in adjacent cells. And so, um, and to me at least also when we are, when we're just looking at having the differences be not prime, using one as the differences for in as much as we can, 
I think makes intuitive sense because then it gives us one less thing to think about because like counting numbers by ones is intuitive and has nice properties and is just easy to work with. Um, so I think that I think really the key to this problem is like as soon as you see that this idea doesn't work for large or for prime n and m, don't like just give up on it immediately. Think like okay, can we make a slight change to it so that it will work? Um. Yeah, so there are, a, or so that that's one way you can think about it in any case. Okay, so we'll move on to D real quick. This one, I know, I feel like I don't have great intuition for this one, so this is going to be a bit of a longer, exp um, a, a more long-winded ex and not as rigorous explanation, whereas E and F actually, once we get there, e, I think both of those will be pretty quick. Um, yeah, but if we start with... Um, or but starting with D, we have a bracket sequence, so string S of length N consisting of parentheses. We're going to start on the first le er, character of the string, and we're going to make a sequence of moves left and right to get to the last character. And we want for we want this string to be a regular bracket sequence at the end, and we want to tell whether we can do it. But there are also Q queries, where each query is going to flip whether a character is in open or closed parentheses. And after each query, we have to determine whether the string is walkable. So there are a few observations we should make first. So the first observation is if n is odd, then the total number of characters we visit will have to be odd. Because basically, any move to the left has to be paired with a move to the right. And so the only moves that actually like will affect the parity of the total number of moves is our like starting is our moves to the right. So one, two, three, for example. And moreover, a regular bracket sequence has an even number of characters because um, it has to have as many open parentheses as closing parentheses. And so that tells us that if n is odd, the answer is always no. So that makes things a little bit easier. Um, so now suppose n is even. So I'm going to do a quick definition here. We'll say that the balance of a parenthesis string is the difference between the number of open parentheses and the number of closed parentheses. And it turns out that um, one way we can think about regular bracket sequences, which might be familiar to some of you, is that a uh, bracket sequence is regular if the balance of each of its prefixes is non-negative and the balance of the whole string is zero. Okay, so now let's think about when walking backwards might, or when going back to the left might be useful to us. So if we walk between an open and a closed parentheses, then the balance of our, of our string that we're creating isn't going to change because we're going to ha it's going to decrease by one and increase by one and decrease by one and increase back by one and so on. And so going like back and forth on an open and closed parentheses isn't going to do anything. But if we have two open parentheses in a row, walking back and forth between them is going to just increase our, bra our balance. And we can keep doing that to increase our balance as much as we want. And so in particular, once we reach two adjacent open parentheses, we are no longer at risk of having a negative balance. Because, if, because we can get our balance as high as we want just by walking on those two um, parentheses. What that tells us is that if we have, if our um, string S has a negative balance before we reach the first pair of opening open parentheses, um, the answer is no, because we, we can't like get a more positive balance, or we can't, or because we're, I guess we're forced to have a negative balance at that point. Um, otherwise, though, we're never going to run into issues with having our um, balance be too negative. And then it turns out that there's a similar idea where once we reach two closing parentheses, we can make our balance as negative as we want. And this is useful for getting making sure we end up at zero balance at the end. And so um, it turns out that, and, the, and one way to think about this is to consider what would happen if we just revert, or if we just flip the string. Um, but it turns out that 
if um or that um if the balance of some suffix of our string and here we're so here we're looking at um some prefix of our string. So if the balance of our sum of some suffix of our string is negative before we reach the last uh, two closing parentheses, then the answer is also no. And this is because that we, um, sorry, no, this should be positive. And so the and so an example of when this would matter is let me write one real quick. If we have something like this string, for example then we can't get to then any pot any um bracket sequence is going to have to have a or we can't have one with zero balance because we um even if we're at we happen to be at zero balance over here then as we walk through these open parentheses we're going to end up with a positive balance and so it turns out that the criteria or that and i think the editorial may have a nicer proof of this um but it turns out that the answer to our query is yes, if there is no um, prefix with negative balance before the first pair of open parentheses, and no suffix with positive balance after the last close of parentheses. Now, in terms of ways to compute this, the way I had, or the way I thought of in contest, which I don't think is the most elegant, but it did, it passed, but it took longer than it should have to code uses a lazy segment tree. Um, so the idea is, so if we, I'll just think about the first condition and then the second condition is similar. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a lazy segment tree supporting range add updates and range minimum queries. And I'm going to maintain the balance of every prefix of the tree, or sorry, of the string, noting that um, in open parentheses, adds one to the balance of every prefix afterwards, while a closed parentheses subtracts one from the balance of every prefix afterwards. And I'll also maintain the position of every pair of opening parentheses. So, um, so then I can query the seg tree to see if there's a negative balance prefix before the first pair of opening parentheses, which is gets us what we want. But um, it turns out that there's a much easier way to do this, which is, was explained to me by the um, coordinator of the contest. So the idea is that if we don't see have a pair of opening parentheses, or a pair of opening parentheses, or and we don't have a negative balance at any point, then there's only one possible way we can do the string. Um, because so if we, we have to start with a close or with an opening parenthesis to make our balance non-negative, and then we can't have two opening parentheses in a row, so we need to have a closing one, and then we need to have an opening one to make the balance positive, and so on. This is the only case where we can where we can avoid both a pair of open parentheses and a negative balance. So what that means is that as soon as we deviate from this string then we're going to either have a negative balance, in which case the answer is no, or a pair of, of open parentheses, in which case we're good to go. So the first condition is equivalent to saying that the first parentheses, the first open parentheses in an even position, which is where it's not supposed to go, must come before the first closed parentheses in an odd position. And likewise, the second condition is equivalent to saying that the last closed parentheses in an odd position must come after the last open parentheses in an even position. And so for this solution, we can just check to make sure, or we can just check both of these conditions by maintaining the positions of open parentheses and even positions and closed parentheses and odd positions. And then it becomes really easy to check and the code is super short. Um, so this is much easier, or so this is much easier both to like prove correctness and to implement. Um, although it isn't what I did in contest, I was told I asked the coordinator if the model solution had a uh, lazy seg tree, and then he explained this to me, which I think makes the problem a lot more nice. Um, but just to show you my solution, the one bit of cleverness I did is the first, or is so after I deal with the n odd case and just output no. Um, 
So I handle, I write this go method, and the go is doing the first case. So it's checking to make sure that there's no negative balance before the first double open parentheses. And so I maintain a set dubs of all the double open parentheses, and then for each flip, I update dubs, I update my seg tree, and then I do my query. And then rather than writing a second function to deal with the second condition that I have to check, I just essentially reverse the string and then flip all the parentheses. And then I reverse all the positions of the queries as well. And then the second checking the second condition is the same as checking the first condition on this modified string. And so I can just run go again, and then I can make sure that, the ch that both checks worked, and then if so, I output yes. So that's, a or so that's the um, slight bit of cleverness you can do to make the data structure solution less ugly than it has to be, but I still think that this, so or this approach is a lot nicer. Yeah, so that's problem D. Um, that one, I think, is a little bit tricky to think about rigorously, and it turns out that E and F actually both can be explained a lot more quickly, which is nice. So if we look at E, for E, we're given an array of n integers, and we want to count the number of arrays of m integers, where n is less than or equal to m, such that all the elements of this array are between 1 and k, and they contain a as a subsequence. Um, and we have to print the answer mod 10 to the 9 plus 7. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about building b step by step, so element by element. At each step, we have two choices. First, we can include or we can add the next number in A, so we can basically make our subsequence one longer, or we can pick one of the k minus one other numbers. So we're going to use, um, so we'll use this idea to do complementary counting. Um, so what we're so we're going to start with the k to the m power of m. There are k ways to pick each element and m plot total elements total sequences that B could be, and subtract out the sequences that don't um, contain A as a subsequence. So what we're going to do is we're going to iterate, or is we're going to say that the longest prefix of A that appears as a subsequence of B has length I. So we're going to iterate over the possible values of I. And so just as an example, if we're looking at the second case where our subsequence is 1, 2, 2, then if we have, I don't know, 2, 1, 2, 3, i is 2 here because the longest, because we can get the 1 and then the first 2, but we can't get the second 2. Um, so we're going to, and so for a fixed i, we know, or we know that within b, we'll take the next element of a, i times, and some other value, um, m minus i times. So that gives us m choose i ways to choose which i times we take the next element of a. And then on the times when we pick some other value, there's k minus 1 ways to choose what that other value is. So there's k minus 1 to the m minus i ways to choose those remaining values. So this is actually, so this is the number of bad sequences uh, for a given i. So our answer is just m to the k, or sorry, k to the m, minus the sum over i from 0 to n minus 1. Those are the possible values of i where we don't have our entire a as a subsequence of m choose i times k minus 1 to m minus i. And this can be pretty directly computed using modular exponentiation. We're just going to read in m, n, and k. Um, and then rather than computing the choose function directly, because computing m factorial could be slow with m up to 10 to the 9, I'm just going to use the fact that m to, so, so m to 0 is 1, m to 1 is m, m to 2 is, and I'll write this as m divided by 1, m to 2 is m times m minus 1 divided by 2 times 1, m choose 3 is m times m minus 1 times m minus 2 divided by 3 times 2 times 1, and so on. And so you can use this formula essentially to figure out the, or to compute the m choose i as we iterate over i. Um, and so 
we're going to start with k to the m as our answer. And then for each i, we're going to update our choose function. And then we're going to subtract out our choose times k minus 1 to the m minus i. Um, and an important thing to know here is that the array A doesn't affect our answer at all. It turns out that like the answer is the same no matter what A is. Um, but we still have to read it in because otherwise we'll run into weird issues where we might like read in the first element of A as N for the next test case. Always asking S, so problem E is just a math problem? Yes, it's just math. I mean, technically, like, if you're unfamiliar with the ideas, there is some computation involved in figuring out, like, the choose functions and then also doing these exponentiations. Because k to the power of m, for example, if we were to evaluate it naively, we would just multiply k by itself m times, and that would be too slow. Um, but in this case, um, but it, um, that's just modular exponentiation, which is a pretty standard algorithm. Um, so let's see, um, Ada asks in the chat, can I get your template? Yeah, I think I have it on GitHub's, or sorry, not GitHub, Pastebin somewhere. Let me log in and grab it for you. Um, oh, this doesn't have my debugging template. Um, yeah, hold on, I'll upload it real quick. Um, just to be clear, by the way, most of this code is not mine, but um, it's sort of adapted from Ben Q's template, and then I can't remember where I got the debugging template from, but... Uh, hold on. Okay, here's the link. Alright, cool, so let's look at problem F. This was kind of a neat idea, although the implementation is it's not terrible, but it is, it, it is a little bit ugly. So we have an n by n grid of conveyor belts. Um, and each conveyor belt can be configured to move boxes up, down, left, or right. But one of the belts is stuck, and um, it'll always move boxes in some same fixed direction, no matter how it's configured. Um, so we get to perform up to 25 tests where we can assign a direction to all n squared belts, place a box on one of them, and then we can see where the box goes or if the box just stays in a cycle. Um, and we have to figure out both which conveyor belt is broken and what direction it's moving in. So the first thing we might try... Oh, hold on, sorry, there's a uh, question. Probably this is a dumb question, but in general, why do we need mod inverse when dealing with divisions and mod something problems? Um, because we, if we were to just like divide by... We can't like use decimals or anything in... Um, dealing with these problems because um, we might run into precision issues. Like, I guess, I don't know. It's sort of, I guess the answer to your question sort of depends on what you might think we would do instead of mod inverse. Um, but big picture, the issue is that we need to be working only with integers when we do these problems. And so, um, modular, and so modular inverse essentially lets us represent fractions as integers. Okay, um... So the first thing we might try is we might say like, okay, well, let's set all the conveyor belts in the same direction and let's see if we can figure out at least like what direction the bad conveyor belt is going in. Um, the problem is, is, with this is that if we aren't, or is that um, if we say like, let's say like we're configuring all of these conveyor belts to go down, then if we start the box on some row and then the broken conveyor belt isn't in that row, then it will just go straight down and we won't get any information. And so, and of course, if we can only get information about one row, um, whatever row we place the box in, or sorry, I guess I should say column here, then we're not it's not going to be very helpful because if we, um, because we only have 25 queries and there could be up to 100 rows, so we need to be getting information more efficiently. So an intuitive idea is that we probably want to configure the conveyor belts in a way that will, um, oh, sorry, conveyor, in, in a way that will give us information about many or most of the, um, of the belts. And so to do that, we need to arrange the, uh, or the belts in some pattern that'll lead our box to eventually, like, iterate over all of them. And the best way, or not the, 
not necessarily the best. I don't know if there are other solutions, but one way we can do this is using zigzagging patterns. And so I'll show you these are like the patterns that I use. Um, but essentially, I created eight zigzags where basically we just start in one of the four corners, pick one of the two directions to go in, and then we just zigzag back and forth until we reach the end. And so with, um, um, with, or if we start in the top left corner and then start by going to the right, for example, we get this zigzag where we go right down, right down, right, or sorry, right down, left down, right down, left down, and then all the way off to the right. And then likewise, if we start in the bottom left corner and then start going up, we get a zigzag like this. Now, what it turns out is, so if none of the conveyor belts were broken, we would expect, for example, this zigzag, if we start at the beginning, if we start our box here, we would expect to end at this X. It turns out that no matter where we place the box, uh, or sorry no, ma sorry, no matter which conveyor belt is broken and which direction it's forced to go in, um, at least one of these zigzags will give an unexpected result. So just to give you an example, if this conveyor, if this um, conveyor belt is actually forced to go up, then we would go right, right, up, and then we would realize that there's a problem. That there's a problem because we didn't end up getting here. Or if this, let's see, um, if this conveyor belt went up, for example, then we would go to the right, down, to the right, down, and then this would take us up, and then we would go back, and then we would go up again, and we would get in an infinite loop. And so, and so anyway, so the, the proof is kind of just caseworky, um, but it can be proven that one of these zigzags will give us an, un or an unexpected output for any, no matter like where the error is. So we're going, we'll start by testing all eight zigzags and finding one where, uh, the, or with an unexpected output. Once we've done that, we're, we then want to figure out where the or the broken conveyor belt is. And the way we do this is we're going to binary search for the first position on the zigzag such that starting there gives an unexpected result. And so to illustrate this like for if we are if we have if we know that this zigzag for example gives an unexpected result, then we might say, okay, well, what if we start in the middle of the zigzag here? And notably, know that like, we're going to order the positions in like the order we visit them on the zigzag. So we're going to start, so like in other words, this position is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and so on. So we might say, okay, if we start here, at this middle cell, does it give us an unexpected result? And if so, then we know that like the broken conveyor belt must be after this position, and otherwise it has to be before this position. And so let's say like, no, we can, if we start here, we get all the way to the end. Then we might say, okay, what if we start like here? And then if we, and then maybe we say, okay, now we do get an unexpected result. Maybe we end up over to the left. So we might say, if we start here, do we still get an unexpected result? And so on. So we're just doing binary search. Okay. And so once we do that, we can, this tells us which position or which conveyor belt is broken. And so now we just need to figure out the direction. And this is pretty straightforward. There are a lot of ways of doing this. The way I did it is I'm just going to set all the conveyor belts to go down. And then we can basically do, we can basically see, so if all the conveyor belts are going down and we're going to start the box on the broken position. And it turns out that, so if we go, so let's say this one is broken, for example. If we go, if the, uh, if that, um, if that conveyor belt will always go down, then we're just going to move straight down to the end. If it always goes to the right, we're going to go to the right one and then down. If it always goes to the left, we're going to go the left to the left one. And normally if we're like in the middle, for example, we go to the left and then all the way down. But this time we go to the left and then we just stay there because there isn't a conveyor belt to the left of this row. And then if we go, and then if it's configured to go up, then we would just go up, down, up, down, we would end up in an infinite loop. 
or if we ended up here, for example, if, or if here, for example, if this conveyor belt was broken and going up, then we might go up and then just stay there. But in any case, depending on what which of the four directions we're going in, we'll get a different position no matter how it is. So, um, and so we can output that or that direction as our answer. And to make sure that we aren't using too many queries, so the first step, if we test all eight zigzags, that's going to be eight queries. You can optimize this a little bit down to seven queries by saying, if we tried the first seven zigzags and none of them work, then it must be the eighth one, but that's not necessary to get AC. Um, and then the binary search, so the base two logarithm of, of 10,000 is a little under 14, so that's gonna take 14 queries. And then the last step is just one query. So this is going to take eight plus 14 plus one, which is 23 queries in total, so it should pass. So I'll go through my code. To generate the eight zigzags, I actually have a slightly clever way of doing it. What I do is I start by generating the first zigzag, the one that I showed you from my example here. And then I generate the four rotations of that um, zigzag. So this one, this one, and this one. And afterwards I generate the for or the reflection over or just like the uh, yeah just a reflection um, over the center of each of these four zigzags and that gives me my four um, distinct zigzags down here and so that gives me my eight zigzags in total so afterwards I iterate over them I output the starting position and then I build the string of conveyor belts corresponding to each zigzag um, and then afterwards I check okay where do I end or where do I end up and does this match the position I expect to end up in um, and if it doesn't then I say okay IL which is like storing the position of the zigzag where we get an unexpected result um, is I and then we end the loop so then here's my binary search for the second phase so I just repeatedly um, output my the zigzag that I'm interested or sorry, so I, I output the zigzag that I'm interested in and for my starting position, I choose, um, for my starting position, I choose the position mid um, within my cycle. And so then I read in Kerr, and as before, if Kerr is unexpected, then I know that the um, broken conveyor belt has to be at or after the current conveyor belt, so I set low to mid, and otherwise, I know that the broken conveyor belt has to be before mid, and so I set high to mid minus one. So after that, I um, I do my last query. So I, I query the broken position, and then I just put C of zero, which C of zero is just the down arrow. And then I essentially just check, okay, which of the four cases does this match up with? And I output that as my answer. So yeah, that's how the problem goes. Um, if, if anyone has questions about this problem or any of the others, I'm happy to answer them. But I think that's the gist of it. We can see how system testing is going. Um, looks like all of my solutions AC'd, except we'll see about my uh, F. Yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone has, or so any, if anyone has more questions, I'm happy to take them. Always async asks, "Do you have a Discord server?" Currently, I do not. Um, LMQ asks, "How did you test your code?" So I don't know if this is a question specifically about F or about how I do things in general. So generally, what I do to test my code is I have a second um, command line over here, and so I'll compile my code here, and then I'll just run it over here. Um, for F specifically, for like interactive problems, I don't have like a super fancy way of doing, um, do, of testing because to do that you would need to actually write your own interactor and that would take a while. Um, so I'll just like run it and then I'll just basically act like I'm the interactor. So I'll read three and then I'll, if I, if the answer let's say is this, like in this first sample case is this second thing should go up, then I'll just like output what I know the answer should be. So here I guess it would be. I think uh, zero two. Um, here is just going to be three four, three four zero two, and uh, zero two. Yeah, so I so I would just test it manually like that, which is a bit of a pain, but um, it works. 
All right, awesome. So if there are no more questions, I think that will be all for today. So thanks everyone for joining and hopefully I will see you next time for the Div 3 on, um, on Tuesday. Uh, someone asked, do you think problem B should be tagged with math? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, it seems like there need, I don't know if it, this code forces have just like an ad hoc tag. So that's probably what I would use. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I feel like it depends. I don't know what the norm is for what problems are tagged as math because this doesn't require any fancy computations or anything, but it is like, it is like fundamentally making a mathematical observation and then um, just implementing it pretty directly. But on the other hand, a lot of problems are like that. And if every problem like that is tagged math, then basically every code forces problem would be tagged math. So um, yeah, I don't have a strong opinion either way. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for joining and I will see you all next time.